Hello, I'm Ari. And I'm Claudine. Welcome to Proving the Negative. We're a podcast all about exploring the different sides of cybersecurity, from political science to computer science, international relations to mathematics. Join us as we talk to our friends about the work they do. Today we're talking about how app design may affect children, specifically in apps that are targeted towards kids, and how data collected from those apps could potentially be putting kids at risk. Uh, Ari, is that something you know much about? I can't say I know much. It sounds like it's going to tie into safeguarding or looking after kids. Does it draw any parallels with your work? Not really. I, I tend to focus on adults in my research, but this topic is very relevant right now, given that online safety or digital safety for children has been all over the news for, for a while, particularly in, in the UK, with pieces of legislation such as the Online Safety Bill or, much more directly related, the age-appropriate design code. People hear the word cybersecurity, the first thing they think about is hacking and technical things and hacking satellites, website databases, things like that. I do think it's grown way beyond that. It's not just about the technical aspects, it's also about people, about you know what is right and wrong, so the ethics part of it. It's related to security of computers and people and however that, that connects together. It's as much about people as it is about technical elements. My name is Anirudh. I'm a third year DPhil student at Oxford. I'm part of the Human Centered Computing Group. I focus on ethical and responsible app development for children. I do this because a lot of the products that both children and adults make use of are designed in such a way to keep us busy, to keep us occupied and hooked, and also to try and collect as much data as possible. This can have some concrete consequences. It can lead to mental health issues such as addiction, loss of attention, or even violent behavior in kids. Data sharing and loss of privacy can also have some concrete consequences. For example, once a child grows up and decides to apply for a job, their resume or CV could go through an automatic profiler, which might make use of data it collected from the child when younger. All of this can have negative consequences. This means that when we are designing services for kids, there are certain things we have to keep in mind. We shouldn't try to keep them hooked for as long as possible. We shouldn't persuade them into disclosing any unnecessary data. I'm working with developers and product owners to see how we can incentivize apps which are age appropriate and child friendly. Why is it that you got particularly interested in researching kids, specifically when it comes to issues of digital resilience, privacy, and responsible design? In a way, I just rolled into it. Kids are a vulnerable population, and they require different protections from adults because adults, they're responsible for their own decisions. The same cannot really be said for kids because they might not be able to make those same decisions. They might not be fully aware of what privacy is why it's important. They require extra protections. I've heard developers say, yeah, you know what, the things we do for children, it wouldn't be a bad idea to do them for adults as well. I'm hoping that whatever we do here, we can extrapolate that to a wider audience. Initially, when I thought, okay, I'm gonna do something in the digital ecosystem, I first thought, okay, I'm gonna be working with children. However, that didn't turn out to be the case. Instead, I I decided to work with developers. A lot of the apps on the Google Play Store or the Apple App Store, they're collecting a lot of data through data trackers and third-party libraries. One of the first questions we had was, okay, why are developers doing this? Are they bad people? Why are they creating apps which are harmful or could potentially be harmful for kids? That's really how it started out. We interviewed developers and asked them, what are your development practices? And what do you think about data collection? What do you think you should be doing about this? That's really how it started. Initially, we didn't really know what to expect. We thought they would say something like, okay, we want to earn money, so we're, <laughs> we're collecting data, or, or something like that. But once we spoke to the developers, we found out they're not really bad people at all. Their motivations are good. They tell us we don't want to harm children. We, we really we understand they're in their formative years. They're vulnerable and we bear a certain responsibility when creating apps for children. However, it's quite challenging to create child-friendly apps. And well, there are several reasons for that. One of them is that we, we need analytics. We need to know what our users are doing, how they're behaving. And this means that they have to make use of third-party analytics tools. The most popular ones are from large data controllers such as Google, meaning that Google also has access to all of this data. 
Nowadays, it's almost impossible to create apps or services without making use of third-party tools. And they said, well, we don't always know what these third-party libraries are doing in the background. Sometimes they're collecting data that we're just not aware of. So we've got apps, they make use of large amounts of third-party libraries, and no one really knows what exactly is happening in the background. That's the second problem. And the third problem is, at the end of the day, we do have to make some money because we're not a charity. So we, we do need to earn some money as well. How, do you, how can you compete? Simply having users pay for the app doesn't work because, first of all, you might not get enough downloads. So not enough people might actually buy the app for you to make a living. The only option then that's left is targeted advertising which means we're using kids' data to potentially influence uh, behaviors and persuade them into installing more apps. Sometimes users want exactly this. They're saying, you know what, we can't pay for the apps because they're too expensive. If you don't make them free, we're going to leave bad ratings. Developers are forced to remove the payment features and actually make them free and incorporate the targeted ads. These are three of the most prominent challenges we found for developers to create child-friendly apps. The very big question for my research is, okay, what is the actual solution? And that's what we're trying to answer. Just for general clarification, what is a tool or a toolkit in this context? If you make use of a third-party tool or a library, that software you haven't developed yourself. A lot of big companies like Google, Facebook, Unity, for example, they've got their own third-party libraries they put out there and they're saying to developers, we created this, but feel free to use them. Google Analytics is, is one of them. Analytics in, in this case means keeping track of who's coming to your app or website, where are they coming from, uh, what is their gender, how, how long are they using the app. Very useful, of course, but you know exactly what's going on with your service and how, how you can improve it. I just want to say it's not a, a data tracker, it's not one particular software, it's more a generic term for a piece of software which could be collecting data and sending it back to that server. A lot of apps ask for certain permissions. They might say something like, hey, this app needs permission to um, look into your contacts or record your calls. Apps like Facebook, they want access to as much as possible. There is a reason why a lot of these third-party libraries are free. They are making money with it, just not the way you think they are. They're collecting as much data as they can. This is being used for advertising purposes. This is how Google earns their money. The moment you click on an ad, they connect advertisers with you. They get a commission. The reason third-party libraries such as Google Analytics are free is so that they have more data about you. And they can more efficiently show you ads you are more likely to click on, meaning in the end, they'll end up earning more money. The same is true for Facebook. They want all of these permissions. They want to collect all that data for exactly the same purposes as well. Why do children and young people need to be resilient? We put them in environments that we build and we force them to interact with each other and, and adults in these spaces. What are your thoughts? Digital resilience means children have the tools mentally as well as some digital tools to cope with the challenges that they're facing. Plugins for the browser and some add-ons for your phone which can prevent data sharing. The mental tools are important as well. If you do find out that your data has been shared or a photo of you has appeared online which you didn't want to be online, how do you cope with that? They're the ones participating in social media. They're overwhelmed with so much information. At the end of the day, they're the ones facing all of that. That's what digital resilience is about. Facebook and, and a lot of companies, they have um, funders and investors who, who just want to see it make money. Um, because that's very important. In that process, they don't particularly take children's needs into mind. The responsibility to protect whoever is using it falls on the user. With kids, the responsibility is shifted onto parents or the caretakers. We have to do it because there, there really is no one else. But also, it's not going to get any better. It's not like Facebook is going to disappear or we're going to stop developing technology. If anything, we'll become more connected, and children will grow up more and more in a digital world. The pandemic, for example, ch children were attending school through the computer. And where before we taught children how to navigate the physical world, 
now we have to teach them, okay, how do we navigate this this digital world? It just developed so quickly, or, you know, 10, 20 years seemed like a long time, but we're just not equipped to deal with some of these rapid technological developments. And now we're trying to catch up, and now we're finding out if you're on Facebook, it can actually lead to depression because we're constantly comparing ourselves with people who seem to actually have it better. How do we deal with this? How do we how do we tell children, okay, you know what, this is not actually the truth? We're we're playing this game of, of catch up. There are often assumptions made about levels of competence for adults, which isn't necessarily which isn't necessarily the case. Yeah, that, you know, parents do play a big role. They might not know what the dangers are. They don't have the tools either. I, I do agree that parents have a responsibility here, but how do we tell parents about this? How do we educate them? Should this happen through the schools? Should schools have get-togethers where they can discuss these things with parents? I'm not entirely sure what, what the answer is here. I don't really know what these platforms do and, and do not know. Very few people are aware. However, on the one hand, they know exactly what they're doing. They know exactly how to hook users. However, long-term consequences require some intensive research. For example, a child growing up using Facebook, what are the consequences once that child has become an adult? How does this person engage with other people? How does it impact their relationship with their kids or with the people around them? These are questions we simply cannot answer just yet. And I highly doubt that these platforms are aware of that either. It requires a lot more research. The problem for these platforms is they'll do research which benefits them. So research, okay, how can we keep people engaged? How can we improve their experience? But not so much, okay, what, what are their harms and how can we prevent them? This is a very difficult question to answer and there's no easy solution to this. If we tell someone to create an ethical app, how can we actually make that happen? There is no strict definition of what an ethical app is, of course. But let's just say that you don't persuade children to use your app for hours and hours and you don't collect unnecessary data. You're likely to earn less money. That's a big issue. We don't have a lot of power, actually. If we really want to change this ecosystem, we need cooperation from major players. For example, what Apple has done, they've added the pop-up where you can opt in to tracking. So do you agree to this, yes or no? This is good for the end users. This is not something we could have done ourselves. We really need Apple or Google or Facebook to cooperate. We're doing two things. One, we're raising awareness. We're trying to inform developers, listen, this designing for kids is actually quite important. These are the reasons and, and you should comply with these rules. Secondly, a lot of these rules tend to be a little bit abstract, you know, be transparent in what you do. That's great, but what exactly does that mean? Concretely, what do you have to do? Does that mean you have to immediately show your privacy policy the moment people open up your app? If you have a huge privacy policy, a child is not going to read it. Raising awareness and developing some tools by making a bit more concrete, we're hoping that it's easier to, to develop for kids. We've got a few players here. We have developers, we have social media platforms, we have advertisers, and we have users. What role do you think regulation should play in managing this problem? Regulation has started to play a larger role. For example, a few years back, we saw the introduction of the GDPR, which changed the landscape a little bit. In the UK, we saw the introduction of something called the age-appropriate design codes, which tell developers and organizations how to develop certain services for children, how to make it age appropriate. I don't know how much impact they will have because these big organizations, they're just so powerful. It's hard to bypass them. A few years ago, Zubov wrote a book called The Age of Surveillance Capitalism. She describes how organizations circumvent the role of governments and regulation. One of the things they do is to make their practices the new normal. And the example she gave was Google Maps. What Google started doing was going around and, and just photographing everything, people's houses with cars, and suddenly it became the new normal. We were so used to having these maps available to us that no one really questioned them. When there was some pushback, they made some minor changes, which weren't really changes at all. Then we kind of forgot about it. Regulation can sometimes be a little bit slow, by the time it actually 
tackle certain issues we might have already gotten used to, that being the new way of life. One of the potential issues here in terms of children and their use of apps and and social media is that the collection of their data could potentially harm them in the long term. What specifically did you mean by that? There are several different harms. I'll mention two now. One is mental health and well-being. For example, addiction. If you're scrolling Facebook or if you're playing an online game, they're designed in such a way that they keep you busy for as long as possible. And addiction can lead to all types of problems, right? You know, loss of sleep, um, or whatever, increased violence, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Depression, anxiety when using social media. The second category, which is important, is privacy. The harms seem very far away. They're not immediately visible. But as mentioned, these are related to decreased opportunities in life, risks associated with data theft, fraud, identity theft, these things primarily. Privacy is, of course, a huge part of of security. It's all related. Some of the harms related to loss of privacy is not immediately clear. Google is collecting my data, but I haven't really felt anything. Nothing has happened. So what exactly is the issue? There are harms which can arise from this. Most concretely is data theft. Google or, or Facebook can be hacked and suddenly your data is in the hands of someone else. They can use it for fraud related purposes. They might get a hold of your bank details. They could impersonate you. More interestingly are harms associated with long-term opportunities. For example, um, you know, Facebook and Google might have data from you which they've collected over the course of, let's say, 20 years, 20, 30 years. They might be sharing this with third parties. It could be that your insurance rates are a lot higher because of some of your behaviors when you were younger. Something as simple as how you were using your mobile device. You showed a lot of hand movements. You're less careful. Your insurance rates are higher. And the question is, is that fair? Because how you behaved 20 years ago might be very different to now. This is an example of how loss of privacy and data sharing happening you know, when you're a child can impact you when you're a lot older. There, there have been examples where resumes and CVs have been scanned by an algorithm and it profiled against women, for example, data collected when you were a kid for maybe a toy or maybe some website you made use of, combined it or CV, suddenly you got rejected. That's a different example of how data sharing can impact you negatively. If you had unlimited time, money, personnel and resources at your disposal, How would you tackle some of the challenges that you face? One of the things which I'm interested in is mindfulness. I'd be very curious to find out if digital resilience can be added as a subject. Kids could be taught about these issues that we've discussed so that they're more equipped to handle it later on in their lives. This would be interesting for researchers to look at. This could be very beneficial in the long term. This might be one of the things I would allocate those funds to. Is there anything that you and your colleagues have learned from kids and young people? What we have learned from kids is what their needs are. We keep talking about make it ethical, child-friendly, age-appropriate. But what I've totally not discussed is what exactly that means. We can learn from kids. We can ask what is important to you? What are your needs? Based off of these needs, we can think about how does this feed into what developers are creating? We can keep that in mind. For example, don't make a pop-up notification at eight o'clock in the morning because then they should be focused on school. What we learn from them, we can use in the development of tools or in informing developers. What is next for you? Developing for kids is important beyond the UK. Right now we're focused on the UK market. For our next steps, we are hoping to develop a collection of tools for developers, which makes age-appropriate and child-friendly design for kids easier. For example, a video course, design templates, code libraries, asking what exactly will be useful for you and what will you actually use in your development practices. Then prototype and develop them and release it to the wider audience. We're hoping to establish a community around that, which we can take internationally. Where can people keep up with the work that you're doing? I don't have a huge online presence. Got the Oxford page, that's it. If people are interested in learning more about the topic, what kind of resources would you suggest that they look at? Even, Even the general news sources, Twitter influencers who post news as soon as it's out can be quite useful. That was our interview with Anirudh. Join us next week for another fascinating conversation. In the meantime, you can tweet at us at HelloPTNPod, and you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. The title there is PTN Pod. See you next week. 
Bye. This has been a podcast from the Center for Doctoral Training in Cybersecurity at the University of Oxford, funded by the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council.